Hey, Hound Dogs, I'm David Hankins. I'm Paul Hankins. I'm Trevor Hankins. And this week, our special guest is Patrick Ballesteros. Yes. Artist. Hello. Hi. Uh, if you've ever been to Comic Con and you go down to Artist Alley, he's the one artist you can never actually see because he is <laughs> surrounded by people. So we're lucky to have him here on the show today. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, no, this is fun. My pleasure. Um, we know you because Trevor took a class from you at the Concept Design Academy in Pasadena. We always like to tell how yep. we know the guest. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you, which has nothing to do with that necessarily, is you live in San Diego, correct? Mm hmm. I and do. You taught a class on pa in Pasadena on Sunday mornings? Yes, I did. Did you drive up Saturday night or Sunday morning, or how did that work? Most of the times, uh, most of the times I would wake up and drive up. So my day when teaching at CDA would actually start probably at 5 a.m. waking up and then just getting ready for the drive, which luckily on Sunday mornings wasn't too bad. Uh, it's usually the drive back to San Diego. That's the, <laughs> yeah. the big pain in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they paid you a lot to do that. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, we'll, we'll keep moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so you did it for free out of the kindness of your heart. That's sweet. Um, I wouldn't say that, but you know, they got a good deal. No, yeah, they must have. Uh, are you still doing that? I am, but now it's all online. So, of course, when everything happened, we shift online, which I was already used to uh, teaching at CGMA. Mm -hmm. But and after everything started opening up, and I think the school started their live classes maybe late last year, I just decided to stay online because I was not about that drive. I mean, if I could, if if I could negate that drive and just teleport up there, yeah. I'd be like, <laughs> sweet. Yeah, I mean, but I mean. Four to five hours every day just driving, it yeah. took a toll. So yeah. not having to do that actually makes me a better teacher. I, I miss I miss teaching in person, interacting with students, but yeah, that drive is kind of brutal, man. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so are you, I'm just gonna ask the question, are you married and have kids or? Oh yeah, 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 uh, I'm married. How many years? She forgets more than I do, so it's not bad if I forget. <laughs> <laughs> He's like 12 years now? Yeah, uh -huh. going on 12 years. And I have a son. He is, he just turned nine. Wow. So almost in the double digits. Wow. Uh, going by fast. I know not you two, but your dad knows how it is. Yes. yes. Just, yes. Saying. <laughs> just saying. Yes. Just so saying. You kind of judge yourself by the, oh my God, you're getting older. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I used to have a theory that kids were there to kind of push you off the planet, you know. Um, <laughs> Or take care of me till I fall off it. So yes. I <laughs> got one. You got two, so you're yeah. good. You're That's in good shape. Hope, yeah. I, I, yeah. I in a spare. Yeah. You got you uh, got a spare right there. So it's good. <laughs> just in case. I'm just saying. Yes. Okay. If I need a kidney, I know where to See? go. See? Yeah. So. You got a two for one special. That's all I'm saying. Right there. Um, so that was a bit hard when you're have a whole family and, and spending that much time on the road on Sunday it must be kind of tough. It's, I think it's something that we adjusted to pretty well. And as an artist, especially when you do have a family, there is no blueprint for that, right? There, you can see all these books about time management and things like that. But with your circumstance, sometimes it just doesn't apply. So I think you just have to make the most of it. But the most important thing is actually, you know, talking about it with your wife, husband, partner. And just figuring that stuff out. And then when you're back home, it's like being there. And I think that's that's the part that I'm continually working on, continuously working on is like being here. When I'm here, being present. Like right now, my son's like, hey, can we play Cuphead later? I'm like, wait, hold on. Shoot. I mean, yes, I will afterwards. OK, cool. <laughs> we're playing Cuphead today. So oh, we'll those things. To keep it too oh, uh, no, no. It's a frustrating game. If you guys haven't played, oh my gosh. Oh, they, anyway. they play yeah, yeah. yeah, right? You're just like, yeah. and it tells you how many times you die. Like, yeah. what is this game? It's like, <laughs> 1,000 times. Like, that's a horrible game. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, sorry. That's fine. Uh, totally derailing it's, things. We talk about video games on the show, too. Uh, when did you decide you, you wanted to discover you wanted to be an artist? Oh, uh, really early on. Five. I remember it vividly. My brother was, he would, he was an artist too, and he was way better than me because, of course, he was older. So he would draw comic book covers all the time, like just copy it verbatim. And I was like, oh, you're doing that. Okay, I should do that too. You know, just copying, mm -hmm. mimicking, mimicking him. So I did. And the first comic book cover we did, it was called The Nam by Maka Golden. And it wasn't like fantastic or anything, it was about Vietnam. 
Right. So you imagine this five-year-old drawing Vietnam covers, <laughs> just things like that. And I thought it was just normal. Like, oh, okay, cool. It's going to do this today. Yeah. Um, so I just started copying him. He would do the covers. I would do the covers. And the thing was, my covers would look not even nearly as good as what he did. It was pretty close. And, and again, this is like five, six. And, and yeah. I got so frustrated that I was like, no, I'm just going to start doing my own character. So a few years later, I just started doing my own thing, my own characters, my own things. He'd still do the covers. I'm like, oh, it looks exact. Never mind. I'll just do my own thing. Yeah. So it just kind of evolved from that point. Is he still an artist or? No, 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 no. He went the total opposite direction. He went to the medical field. Yeah. So I stuck with being art and that was, that was my only job path in my mind was being an artist or nothing else. So I, I had knew I knew nothing about actual a job job that I was going to get. I just knew it had to deal with drawing, and I just kind of stuck with it. I was stubborn in a sense. Right. Yeah. And you're lucky. You're you. I mean, you have talent, and it all worked out for you. But that's that's pretty cool. I, I think a lot of it was just uh, almost like that chip on your shoulder. Everyone always telling you you shouldn't do that, not to do that. Yeah. And especially within uh, kind of like Filipino Asian culture. Of course, parents um, immigrated over here. They want the best for their children. They want them to succeed and do a career that's going to support them. And, you know, every parent wants that. Right. So when you get a kid, like, I don't want to be an artist. Like, what, what are you going to do? Does that <laughs> yes. mean you're just going to sit there and draw squares and color them red and blue? I'm like, no. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, triangles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Triangles or circles. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that was, I don't think, a, a roadblock per se because my older brother took the brunt of that. So they kind of left me alone. And when it came to college, um, I didn't know of art schools at the time. My, I guess when I when I think about it, I had a horrible guidance counselor. They didn't really give me much mm -hmm. guidance. It was like, okay, go ahead. So I just <laughs> honestly applied to the UC system, just every UC school, because uh -huh. um, that's all I knew. I just heard of UCLA and this and that. And then there was a school, UC Irvine. I'm like, oh, they kind of have an art program. I guess I'll try there. And that's where I applied and went to college. <coughs> okay. Have you always lived in San Diego otherwise? No, 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 no. I used to live, um, be, my dad, most people think because he's Filipino that he's in the Navy because there are a lot of Filipinos in the Navy, especially from the Philippines over here. But he was actually an engineer. So that's why we moved a lot because he moved around with different engineering jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the 80s, nuclear was a big thing. So we did live in Texas and then we went to Korea for a couple of years. Wow because uh, there was a nuclear power plant over there that his company was starting up. So I remember vividly being in Korea. And then before California, most of my time was spent in Texas. So it was like Texas, Korea, back to Texas, and then California. Well, yeah, I'm actually from originally from Texas. Ah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were in Houston. I forget the area, uh, but that's where we were. I just remember it was really, really hot in the summer, so you were running to the nearest mall. Uh-huh. Yes. And then for some reason in the winters, you had ice. You're like, what is this weather? It's so crazy. <laughs> There's so. nothing stopping it from coming all the way down from Canada because it's all flat. So it just comes all the way down. And, you get and, the yep. ice and, and it hits you. Yeah. It hits you. Yeah, it's just flat. Me. I don't yep. miss the weather at all. No. no. Uh, even though it's hot. Where we live in the valley, it's hot, but it's a dry heat, not that humidity that you have in Texas. Oh, no, no. The va that it. valley heat is something else, though. It's uh, like I, three I, digits, and you're walking outside <laughs> so much. Ugh. I can take the dry heat over the – trust me. I'm, oh, well, yeah, yeah. I grew up where it was you know, 90% humidity and 100 degrees. <laughs> That's how it is when you visit the Philippines. So you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're basically built for the Philippines. So just go oh, there, and you'd well. be like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> Language, not a problem. Yeah. Weather, you're yeah. good. Just All walk right. around. That's and good. Blend. Uh, so you went to UC Irvine, mm -hmm. and um, so what was your? How did you go from school to having a career as an artist? Oh, it was really rocky, really rocky. Uh, I came out of that school without a portfolio. Um, mm. I, I didn't really improve at all. I just kind of stayed the same, like maybe a little bit of growth because I was drawing, but I didn't get the type of instruction that I needed to get a job out of college. Uh, and I actually started working at a medical clinic that my mom was at, just doing medical files for a couple of years, just to pay my bills, to pay my loans and things like that. And I think the the one smart thing that I did at that young of age without anyone helping me was consolidating all my loans and locking in a low interest rate so that I could pay it off. And I did pay it off eventually. 
Um, so that's what that job helped to do. Even after that, still, I uh, was working on a portfolio, still not good enough. I remember um, a really, really uh, high-end concept artist was a patient and he came in and my mom was like, of course, oh, this is my son, he could draw. <laughs> you know, when your parent says that, oh, yeah. and, yeah. and, you're, and you're a professional, you're a professional, you're like, okay. So I showed, I showed him a couple of my things and he was very nice, very generous with his time. Uh, and then later I found out that there was like an intern position at their, and the, the studio was High Moon Studios at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they did a game, Dark Watch, that was one of their bigger games. So I applied for it and he sat me down, gave me, he was very nice, very considerate, uh, but basically saying I wasn't there and I wasn't. So after that, I went to work at the military, not just as a civilian, yeah, but right. I was working in their graphic design department and I was there for probably about three years. And again, what that gave me the opportunity to do was, of course, pay my loans, pay my bills, and I got health insurance. So while I was doing that during the day, at night, and I was probably um, like 22 to 22 to 25, that's the age I was at to give you context. So doing that during the day and at night, I would take classes at a school called Watts Atelier here in San Diego. It was one of the schools that had classes with traditional, actually, academic drawing, figure drawing, um, and then they also had a few teachers that taught concept design classes, character design, environment, stuff like that. So for me, it was very appealing because I had none of this in college. It was like opening this can of like, oh, can of knowledge. This is great. <laughs> uh, so I, I was there for three years studying, doing this, and still working in the military. And then after that, around 25, age 25, which is like three years later when I uh, first started with the military, uh, I said, you know, I got to move to L.A., so the entertainment industry is there. Uh, there's more schools there. There's more design schools up there, more what I want to get into. Um, it's got to make the jump. And what prompted me to do that was, for me, I, I reached a kind of like a stalemate in regards to my education. I wasn't developing anything further, and I was actually getting stuck because I was trying to stick to this academic approach, this template laid out by other students that I was trying to follow. And it didn't fit me, but I didn't know that. So I was just trying to push my way through it. What happened was I took a few workshops, a few classes in LA. So again, I would drive up to San Diego on the weekends. Um, my wife, girlfriend at the time, she would come with me, drive up with me Sundays. She would go hang out at a coffee shop and stuff while I was in class for like four hours. And there was just something that connected with a lot of the instruction, a lot of the teachers and stuff. And I just had a lot of these holes filled that were like missing in my education. So again, that after coming back down, you know, doing 10 weeks here, you know, 10 weeks there of classes, I just went back down to San Diego and I said, hey, I gotta move. That's where I gotta go. Fortunately, my wife was applying for jobs up there at the time and she moved up at the same time. So it just kind of worked out perfectly. She got apartment, I got apartment. And we were both in LA working in our mid twenties, which was, wow. Really nice, really nice to have that, you know, someone there with me. Okay. And so how did you end up back in San Diego? Uh, we had a kid. <laughs> so <laughs> we had a kid and most of our family was down here, especially yeah. her parents. And I mean, you need a tribe to raise a kid. So our tribe was down here. Um, a lot of the, uh, her side of the family was down here, which is great. Her nieces, nephews, uh, cousins are all down here. So it just made it easier. And we were very, very lucky that I was freelance and um, teaching, just doing projects here and there. And her work, her work actually allowed her to work from home for at least a year. So we just took the advantage of that and said, hey, for well, we're at least going to be down in San Diego for a year. Let's, let's give it a go. And so that's why I moved back. And of course, it did make it easier going to San Diego Comic Con and not having to drive two hours from LA with all your stuff. Yeah. So that was nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the food and laundry is always good too. Just saying. <laughs> real, real talk. Okay. Um, so you, you brought, what? okay, so let's talk a little bit about your typical day for you. I mean, you, you, what do you, what is your typical day like or do you have a typical day? It usually depends on, you know, kind of like the season, I would say. So when I am teaching, my day usually consists of um, 
what I try to do every day, wake up early enough. My flux is between 4.30 to 5.30, but I usually wake up early enough just, you know, just to kind of get awake. But I'll do a, a walk in my neighborhood because there's uh, nice hills, so it gets my blood going. So at least 30-minute walk, come back to the house, do like another 10 minutes of calisthenics just to kind of get my blood going. Uh, and usually before my son wakes up, before anything goes on, I still have maybe about 45 minutes or so. So I'll try to do something that needs a lot of brain power. So that's a, that's the, to my space of time that I reserve for like ideas, things that I really need to think hard about, planning out my schedule for the week, and I need the, that moment of silence. So th that's what I usually do um, for that. And then usually, you know, there's like about an hour where I'm getting my son ready, walking him to school. And then from 9 to 12 is like another work session. Um, and then there's a break in between where I go and do uh, a Pilates class, which I got into 10 years ago. Um, and for any artists listening to this or people with bad backs, it's great to keep you from doing being hunched over a lot when you're drawing or reading or doing anything. So that's why I'm an advocate for it. Uh, and then again, work some more in the afternoon, evening, uh, but when I'm teaching, that's when I have to break that up. So a lot of times if I'm teaching, I have to do critiques for students. Maybe that's in the morning um, and then some at night. So that's usually how it goes. Uh, and then, of course, fitting in family time, fitting in um, an hour for the next Mandalorian episode to watch with my kid. <laughs> Priorities, right? Priorities. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, it, it will fluctuate. It'll fluctuate. But I, I have to be better about an off switch. But that's the thing that I'm constantly struggling with. For me, I don't have an off switch, so it's just in me to kind of keep going until I get tired. So, right. okay. uh, what is your artistic process, and has COVID affected it? Process-wise, I think it's pretty much the same before or after COVID. Uh, before COVID, I would just go to coffee shops, usually to work out my ideas or to get a good work session because I would consider that my office. Uh, during COVID, didn't have that. So I would have to be like in the living room or just go outside in the backyard or do something just to shake it up a little bit. And then once everything opened up again, it just kind of went back to the same, just going to a coffee shop, working. Um, if you, if For anyone that follows me on Instagram, you'll probably see me post. I'm usually this one coffee shop called James Coffee in San Diego. Um, they all know me. It's basically like for anyone that is old enough, cheers, where everyone knows your name. Right. If you don't know that reference, just YouTube it. You'll see. Yeah. It'll kind of make sense, but not really. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yeah. It, it's just those things where I try to change up my environment when, however I can. So whether it was during lockdown or not, you have to find those ways as an artist to just get yourself motivated in a change of environment, even if you're just changing seats. Like when I go to the coffee shop, I change seats so that I'm just not kind of stuck in this one zone. I just try to shake it up a little bit. So even if you're at home, you have this one chair that you sit in, you work in, you know, turn it around the other way or take it to a different table or adjust the height just for a little bit. You know, something just to shake it up, just to see what, what can uh, move your brain in a different manner. <laughs> Uh, are there any artists that inspire or influence your work? It's like a laundry list, but <laughs> times two. There's so many. I know both of you know this, or all of you know this as well. But I think in regards to like the person, I'm like, man, I hate them, but they're awesome. <laughs> uh, that artist would be James Jean. Um, and for those not familiar, James Jean, he started off as comic book artist. Now he does everything. And I mean everything, like wine bottle labels, murals, movie oh, posters, whatever. Yeah. So, and why I picked him is because he's constantly reinventing himself, doing different things. Like I look at some of this work that he does, and I'm like, man, how did he do that print? Or, oh my gosh, that's a sculpture. And so even though he's more, I guess, in the fine art slash commercial world, it's still something in regards to like process and artistic inspiration, artistic, just that artistic mind of being able to do all those things. And there's a business savvy about it that you're like, wow, that's so impressive. So that's the one artist I always just like, man, that's so cool. Now in regards to other artists that I just enjoy just for the pure joy of it, um, 
think Daniel Warren Johnson. He's a comic book artist. I think I said his name right. Um, he did, I think the combos do the power bomb, uh, but he's been he's done a lot. There, you could look him up. Yeah. There, there was one thing on YouTube. It was like a Marvel quick sketch or a quick draw, and they interview the artist. Yeah. I would watch that on him. It's super cool because it, he talks about his family also. Uh, and again, he's one of those artists. You look at his artwork, phenomenal. And how I got into him is just, he would just, on Instagram, he would post all these commission sketches that he did. Oh, man, there's so much energy in it. And it's not like it's fine-tuned or anything. It's really raw and rough, but very, very smart. And very, very, he's a very good designer. So that's a comic book artist that I look at. And then um, one artist, oh, this guy. So I do a lot of kids' books, but this uh, I found this artist in Japan when I was looking at kids' books, Shinsuke Yoshitaki. I'll just hold it up really quick. Uh, he does like a whole series of books, and it's very simple, limited palette. And the drawings aren't really crazy, but there's so much energy and so much fun in them yeah. that I really love looking at him whenever I'm doing kids' books just to kind of see, like, how do you get a message across while being just very simple and very deliberate with the shapes and the design language that you use? So, I mean, it's always going to change, but for me, those are the, the first three that popped into my head when you asked that question. And how would you describe your own art style? My art style... I think generally speaking, when people look at it, um, it's basically childhood nostalgia with a nice twist of pop culture and a hint of um, just watching too much 80s cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> the best way I can explain it. Um, so you, you mentioned children's books. I, I don't think that's something that everybody that goes to Comic-Con associates with you. Um, how'd you get involved in doing those? And are they your own stories or are you hired as the artist or how's that work? So when I first started doing them, it was with someone that I met uh, at a gallery show and he had run his own kind of independent zine magazine. Uh, and he asked me, hey, can you do a cover for him? I'm like, sure. So I did one. And then I think after he saw the cover and he saw my work, he's like, hey, do you want to do a kids' books together? I'm like, oh, sure. I, I was probably like 26, 27. I'm like, okay, I don't, care. I don't know. So I just did it. And we worked on something together. Uh, we, we created characters. He already had some characters in mind, and I gave them a face. It was the first books we worked on were called The Adventures of Super Bunny and Gi Giant Cat Bear and Charlie. Uh, Giant Cat Bear was actually a panda bear. Super Bunny was a kid that wore a superhero costume made out of like to look like a bunny, and then Charlie was a girl who had a pet broccoli carried in around on a leash and swung around <laughs> like Indiana Jones. Yeah. So we always thought that was fun. So he wrote it, and then I illustrated it, and we pretty much art directed it all the way through. So we did about three, I think three or four books in that series, and then you know we just we're all doing it on ourselves, self publishing, doing everything through Amazon Kindle um, or KDP, the publishing direct yeah. uh, direct to print. So we did that for a bit, and then I also did another book with a publisher, Capstone, Capstone Publishing, sorry. Capstone Publishing, it was when MLK wore skates. And that one gets a lot of good publicity because there aren't a lot of books out there when it comes around time to um, celebrating MLK, what he did, what he stood for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was actually also approved by MLK's family. Mm -hmm. So that's always nice to, to know, and it was, most it was a, a biography written in a children's book format so there were some things that were pushed but most of it was based on things that happened and then the more recent kids books i was hired as an illustrator but again it was with the same writer that i did the first series of books with um, there's actually two writers this time and so they had this world uh piper and enza piper is a girl enza is a stuffed bunny that it's almost i would say kind of like calvin and hobbs not quite but that's the closest thing that i would describe it to yeah and the girl calls it enza because when she was sick she couldn't pronounce the word influenza so that's why it's <laughs> enza and uh i was we did three books the third book is actually coming out next weekend at the festival of books where i'll be signing a few of them and uh, that's going to be 
USC campus, I oh, believe. LA Festival. LA yeah, Festival. LA Festival of Books, pretty big. So, and it's free admission. You can just walk in. I'll be I'll be there Sunday. But did some books with them, and right now they just have three, and then that's what they're focusing on right now. And if there's any more in the works, yes, I'm going to be doing my own, um, basically writing and doing everything. So just my very own book. And that's my main goal for the end of this year. After Comic-Con, I'm mainly focusing on that. Okay. You have, seem to have several different lines of arts, or I guess the, if you go to your website, you've got uh, 25 Cent uh, Wonders, My mm -hmm. Quarantine, yeah. uh, Storybook Club. Not you know. So um, what are your inspirations behind them? Mainly how I see it is my mind works basically like a video store back in the 90s. It's like Blockbuster for for those that remember. Yeah, for those that don't, like, again, there is Google. a Blockbuster <laughs> left in the in – the, there's like one left. I think it's in Alaska. No, it's and they actually, Oregon, actually. Yes. Oh, is Oregon? Okay. Yeah. And then there's actually uh, a series on Netflix all about Blockbuster. Very funny. So why I bring up the video store is because – you know, the video stores has their sections of different themes. And so for me, you know, there's the same characters that I use, but I like to create different themes because I think it's just more fun. For me, whenever I create art, yes, there's a lot of familiar characters that you see, but I like to put them in situations and put them in illustrations where I'm adding a bit more storytelling to it. I'm adding a little bit of a twist. I'm giving it something that gives it a different life than what you normally would expect from it. Right, doesn't deviate from it, doesn't change it or distort it too right. much, but just enough so that you go, oh, okay, that's a bit different. All right. And that's, I think, the hardest part, especially when you are at conventions, because there's so much good art there. There's so many yeah, artists. Yeah. And so what do you do? Do you How do you compete with all that? Um, you want to be aware of what's around you so that, one, you're not just regurgitating what everyone else has done. Yeah. Um, and that can be hard. Right? They're, like they always say, there's nothing that's ever original. And there isn't. But you can add your own flavor to it. You can change it. It's like chicken. There's KFC. There's Popeyes. And I'm just saying all this because I'm hungry. <laughs> each, one, yeah. each one gives it their own little flavor so you know distinctly who's who. And I feel like when you're at a convention, that's the same thing. What is that little flavor that makes it just a little bit different here and there? And luckily for me, with... Uh, you know, a bit of luck and also a bit of like doing my research, I'm just able to put some of these ingredients together. So I'm known for certain things. I'm known for a look. Uh, and actually, uh, Comic-Con that I went out went to before in Colombia, they contacted me to do their 10 anniversary t-shirt and poster because they know that I could take a bunch of characters and put it together and make it work. It's not easy, but I've done it so much that I find a rhythm and I find a way to put those things together. It's one of those things where if anyone listening to this has ever had an art teacher and your art teacher goes, just feel it, just go with it. <laughs> and you're looking at them. If it's your first class, that makes no sense whatsoever. You're looking at them like, <laughs> yeah, but how do I draw a head? I don't get what you're saying. When you get past all the fundamental stuff, you go into that zone. It's like the Jedi force of drawing. You're just feeling it. You close your eyes like, okay, that works. Okay, that's cool. And so that's the part that you develop over how many drawings you do, over the illustrations, and, and that's where experience kicks in. So that's what they mean by feel it. And, and with any sport, any type of you know musical score, or whatever, there are technical things, but I bet you like 90% of the time, a lot of them are just going with it. They're just going with the flow, going with their gut. And again, that's all developed. All right. Do you have a favorite line that you or are they all like your children and you can't they're all No, like, no, right now my most the one I have the most fun with is the symphony one. The one where I do where I'm taking really well-known composers and putting them in like a music sheet and the music sheet is um, the notes combined with like the movies that they've done the music movie scores for. Mm -hmm. So that one started with um, the one I called Mr. Williams Opus. So yeah. based on John Williams. Yeah. Uh, and why, how that came about was I was actually, I remember this vividly in that I was at New York at the Met 
and I was looking at some of the paintings of one of my favorite artists, John Singer Sargent. If you don't know who he is, amazing fine artist, portraiture, painting, drawing. Um, technically, no one can beat that guy. Awesome. And when I was looking, oh, I'm sorry, this was in New York. This was in Boston. He had another gallery there. I think it was Boston. Anyway, there Looking was this one piece. So. Yeah, there was one piece where it was just a, an orchestra playing. And I was like, oh, I haven't done anything for music people. So that's when it came to my head, like music people love art too. It's not just music. So I think about what would musicians or even specifically like composers, what would they like to hang up in their wall, uh, in their studio? And so I did, I did a research. And my first, my first pass wasn't going to be the one that I did. I had different ideas, like actual drawing symphonies and stuff like that. And then that music sheet, and I was like, oh, actually, that, that feels pretty good. And so I, that's why I went to that. And so the John Williams is the first one. Um, the last one, the last couple I did was um, Alan Silvestri and also uh, Danny Elfman. Hmm. And the cool thing is someone that bought the Mr. Williams Opus, I, they actually came by WonderCon and uh, I told him I was making a, a part two of it. And he's like, oh, cool. I'll grab that too and give it to John. And I was like, <laughs> who's John? Who's he talking about? <laughs> and then he proceeded to say, oh, yeah, I work at the Hollywood Bowl. And uh, yeah, I gave the other one to John. He loved it. I'm like, oh, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked at my wife. Did you hear that? She's like, what? It's like, John Williams, he has it. In his, I don't know if it's hanging, but he has it in his hand somehow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I thought it was all, I, I was just like, oh. <laughs> the fact that he actually saw it. I'm like, that's so cool. That, uh, so it's just one of those things. Not, It's unbelievable, but it's just really cool to hear. Yeah. This. Uh, a lot of your artwork, like 25 Cent Wonders, is based on existing IPs. Uh, how do you decide what to draw and what format? It's tough. Uh, I think there's always things that you would normally would associate with like an IP and go, yeah, I'm going to draw that because that's normally what you would see. And at first I would do that, like for certain Star Wars ones, I would just do the vehicles and stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. That's it. But as I'm doing more and more of these, one, I need to be respectful of my audience in that you know, I need to give them something different. I need to shake it up. I just don't want them to buy it because they always just buy it. Oh yeah, it's new. I'll buy it from Patrick. I want to change things up so that it keeps it fresh for them, but also for me, because I've I've probably done over a hundred of these. Yeah. So the angles and whatnot, you know, that all kinds of, kind of becomes the same. So you have to change things up just so that you stay interested and so that it has a life when when you give it to a person, because people can feel it in a drawing if you've enjoyed it or if it was forced or if it's like, oh, this one feels better than this one, and I don't know why. <laughs> probably because there was more joy put into it and it's one of those things where even someone who's not an artist they could just get that feeling like oh this one there's a lot of love in this one i like this so for me that's what i try to do i try to think of what is the unexpected what is something that is nuanced that the fan base will appreciate and enjoy so even if it's super niche 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 however yeah. you pronounce it uh that fandom will be like, oh, I like what they picked there. Okay, that's cool. Because then that expresses to the customer that I'm a fan also. And so there's a lot of times where people ask me, oh, you should do this and you should do that. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I know it, but I'm not like a super big fan of it. And so I won't necessarily do a deep dive or do a wonder on it. And so that's the thing that I try to do as much as possible. I don't know if I'm successful or not. But I always try to be a fan of everything that I draw because then I could put those little things, those little Easter eggs. I think a lot of people have come to enjoy that and really look for that when they get a new piece from me. All right. Uh, uh, as, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, as someone who has drawn both, how do you feel about people knowing you for your fan art versus your original art? It's tough. I mean, as an artist, you want to be known for more than just one thing. And there are times where I do original things and it'll hit. And there's other times where, you know, it's just like a thud, right? And that sucks. But 
it's a balancing act, right? Now that I do have people that know my work, I'm you know, it's 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 hoping that they will translate and carry over into other things, your own projects, things that you have a lot of passion for because they see that passion in everything else. And where I have seen that is definitely in the kids' books. Every time I bring those around, I feel like they're different enough where people, whether they have kids, grandkids, they really do gravitate towards them. Like, oh, this is cool. You do this. The other one that really took off, um, I only had a few copies of them, but was my the sketchbook. And it wasn't just, it wasn't an art sketchbook. It was a sketchbook, just blank pages, but I it's my own. My own just, you know, paper that was that was chosen, created my own cover, all this, that. I only had nine of them at the con, but they sold within the first few hours. Gone. All gone. And things like that. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So people are interested in this stuff. All right. And so that's why I'm doing, again, just going into my own kids' books, the second half of this year, again, to see what's going to go on there. Because I love doing the art that I do for shows. I wouldn't do it unless I loved it. Um, yes, people recognize it. Um, yes, it does really, really well for me. But aside from all that, I truly, truly love coming up with these compositions and pieces. And I wouldn't do it if that love wasn't there. So what I'm trying to do is hopefully organically take that into these newer projects that are my own and get people to come over to that. It's not going to be like 100%. Honestly, it's going to be probably even less than 50%. But it's at least an audience that will appreciate and really just like, oh, okay, this is awesome. You're doing this now. I like that. And you do hear those comments. You do get those emails, um, those comments on Instagram or those comments in person. So it, it keeps the it keeps the engine burning, keeps the engine going. I don't want the engine burning. I think an engine burning would be very bad. The light <laughs> going. The candle burning. Candle burning. The, the engine going. Yes, yeah. the kiln. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, when you're making one of those pieces, uh, uh, how much of your process is analog and how much of it is digital? Oh, everything starts traditional. Everything starts analog. Um, most of the times, I, I would say 99% of the time, it's a pen and ink sketch. And it's just like a, a rough doodle. I usually have three sketchbooks rotating around between my backpacks. I have a big 8.5 by 11 sketchbook. I have a small 8 by 5 sketchbook. And then I have just this notebook line paper that I get at the at Daiso because it's only like $1.50. And so I just write and I don't care what goes in there. So these are all notebook sketchbooks that I don't show anyone. So all the ideas start there. So I know those are my three idea books. Everything starts there. And afterwards, I would just scan whatever thumbnail I did, blow it up. And honestly, I just work right on top of that sketch and just refine it. Uh, and why I do that is just because there's something in the sketch that, that has that life that I'm always trying to keep. And I've gotten better at retaining that. Hopefully, it translates well. Uh, and then when I'm transferring it over, before it would be um, taking a picture and then putting it into Photoshop and working on the Cintiq or tablet. But nowadays, ever since 2019, everything just goes into Procreate. I'm just doing all my drawings and finished illustrations in Procreate now. Uh, is it the same with your uh, book illustrations? Yeah, yeah. Everything's Procreate. Um, I do keep Photoshop just for final output, final color tweaks, right. um, any type of text or editing as well. Right. You list a lot of clients on your website. Is there something you've done for one of them that we would all recognize, or is there something you wish people knew more about? Oh, let me think. I think the fun one that was, uh, and I mentioned this in, in when I teach classes, uh, well, I, I was one of the illustrators that worked on the end credits for Alice in Wonderland through the Looking Glass. So if you if that's on Disney Plus, so if you have Disney Plus, just go to the very end credits. <laughs> They're animated, uh, but yeah, I did all of the, I did a lot of the big illustration pieces. So what they did was, they would transition from pen and ink sketches to, the, or from the, from some pen and ink. It went from the last live action scene. And it transitioned to a pen and ink sketch. And I did that. It was Photoshop, but I had to replicate it looking like pen and ink. Yeah. And basically, all of the characters were drawn in that pen and ink style. And there was an animator that in Final Cut would puppeteer them. So what I had to do was create 
a lot of the characters that you saw in the movie as these pen and ink illustrations. And it looked like, you know, they were just moving like this, like just regular puppets. Um, I had to separate a lot of elements. I think there was one where it was Humpty Dumpty and he cracked yeah, and he fell apart. So I had to draw every single crack and piece. So I drew him as a whole and then I would have to cut every piece and create separate layers for each piece so that the animator could be like, just like grabbing them and having them fall. That was a nightmare. <laughs> um, but it was fun seeing it. I, I mean, I didn't watch the movie in the theater. Right. Because I think the first one was way better. The second one, yeah. uh, it's okay. It's Disney Plus, just watch it there. It's cool. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, I, I saw it because the, the art director, you know, showed me the final cut of it. I'm like, oh, that looks cool. So there was a couple other artists that worked on it that did some of the beginning proportion studies and drawings and they had me come in and we work a lot of them um, but a lot of the faces and stuff those are the ones that I did and it was it was fun it was fun I didn't get any credit at all because only the studio got credit right. I think that's a thing with SAG or with the with the studios you can only credit so many people so it just says Blur Studios oh. and that was one of the people in Blur Studios okay. but it was just Blur Studios so I all I could do was like hey I drew that head. Oh, see right there? I did that math. <laughs> so, I mean, that's uh, any artist. The credits, right? Yeah, in the credits. I mean, any artist is like, there's like 10 people that get credit. And then if you're like one of the people in the studio, you can be like, hey, see that shot right there? Freeze it at 10111. That's my shot. I did that shot. <laughs> that's cool. Um, but that that's, that's how it goes. So I did that. And then... And th this next one is really silly, and I don't think it's on my website, but it was fun because it was Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart. They did a Halloween show, a Halloween uh, bake, bake Off show, where, you know, those competitions where yeah. three teams compete and make these Halloween treats. And you see them, and they're like, okay. So my job, uh, if you can imagine those type of shows, when the contestants are talking about what they're going to make, like, oh, we're going to make these treats over here, and it's going to look like this type of scary tree that's going to come down made of licorice and stuff. And then you, you see the graphics kind of pop up. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm the guy that drew the illustrations for that show. So mm -hmm. it's not the contestants drawing them. Sometimes you think it is. No, I was the one that drew it. And again, someone came in and animated it and put all the pieces together. Uh, but that was it was really fun because I got to see it. When I got to see it play live, it's like, oh, my gosh. My artwork's in a show with Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart. Who could say that? How many people could say that? It's so fun. Yeah. So in a case like that, do they come to you and say, we'd like you to do this? Or do you audition yeah. for those kind of jobs? Or Oh, no. They, they, they came to me. I was recommended. So they knew I could do it. Um, they were just asking what type of style or how it looked. So my job was to concept a couple different levels of, like, what type of level would this look like? Or here's a more pushed illustration versus a more simplified. Which one do you guys want to go with? Let me know. And so that wasn't really auditioning. It was more just giving them like, okay, let's figure this out. What direction you want to go in? Because we have a short time. And then so once they picked uh, a direction, then they would just give me references. Um, I had to draw cookies for in some of these shots. It was like, it was like, here's a picture of a cookie. Draw this. I'm like, you have a picture of it though. So, yeah. yeah, but it has to match. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. So I'd be just drawing <laughs> cookies and fangs that look like marshmallows and stuff. I'm like, oh, I think this works. All right, that's cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it was it was fun because it was simple, straightforward. But they they gave me a lot of free freedom to do do these things. And uh, again, when you see it in an actual show, and this is the show that they actually asked me, how do you want to be credited? And I was like, oh, just put illustrator. And then they did, and I saw my name. Ah, oh, free stream. <laughs> cool. This was during COVID though, so I, I was on Peacock, um, the streaming service. So it wasn't like on TV or anything, but it was on Peacock. So I don't know how many people saw it. I just thought it was fun. Yeah. Uh, and that was it's a cool little thing. Uh how does it feel when uh current or former students uh, approach you at a convention? Oh, if they're good students, great. Yeah. <laughs> How do I know the bad ones? I don't say anything. I'm just nodding my head. No. Uh, whenever I see students um, and I'm talking to them, checking in, seeing how they're doing, it's cool. Uh, I think there are some conventions that allow me 
to do a deeper dive and get in a better conversation, Comic Con is not that place. It's more like, hey, you cool? All right, see you next year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, WonderCon is is good for that, unless again, like I saw you guys in there, I had to run off. Apologize yeah. for that. That's fair. But I think one of the places where I really felt that was at Lightbox Expo. Yeah. That was yeah. incredible. Uh, I think that is made for teacher student interaction because I met students from that, that took my class and they were in different continents, different countries. And then I met students that were like from nine, 10 years ago. One made me feel old, but two, it was cool because they remembered me and they would come back and tell me, hey, so I stuck with it and now I'm doing what I wanted to do. And they let me know what they were set out to set their goals for and that they're actually doing it. And so all that, that's really cool. I, I think as a teacher, it's that, oh, okay, I made a difference moment. Because you know, when you're doing these classes, you, you don't really know. Right. Some of these students may come back around. You do see what they're doing. But I would say more, 90% of the students you don't hear from ever again. Like just those first few, you're like, okay, cool. You're doing good. All right. Awesome. Uh, I mean, with the internet, it's, it connects people. It makes it easier to reconnect. But it also makes it a little bit harder because you know, algorithms and all that jazz. <laughs> but uh, okay. I would just say it's great. It's a great feeling. How many conventions do you do a year? I would say consistently about three. I don't really usually do too many. There is at one point where I was doing maybe four to five, uh, but that was in my younger days. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, so I think right now consistently, as long as I get in and I apply, it's WonderCon San Diego, and then the other one, Designer Con in Pasadena. And the five that I mentioned before, it was, it would go Emerald City in Seattle, WonderCon, San Diego, DesignerCon, and then uh, for a stretch, I was doing Comic-Con in Colombia, uh, mm. Bob uh, Bogota and Medellin. Wow. Uh. So that was fun. So you have to apply to get to Comic-Con? Because you're like the, you seem like a huge draw there. Yeah, because Artist Alley is a, one, you, you have to pay now, but it's always been jurored. So there's a, you know, a jury that goes and picks and chooses the artist to go there. So I, the first year, the very first year I got in, and this is to date myself, I faxed in my application. You know, no one has a fax anymore, but I faxed it in <laughs> and I got in miraculously. It was even past the deadline. I faxed it in I'm like, I don't know how this happened. So I got in the first year, which probably was back in 2012. Uh -huh. Then the following year I didn't get in and I was heartbroken. I, I remember it vividly, I was on the couch and I'm waiting, and when I checked the mail, it said we are we are uh, sorry to say that you did not get in, and I was devastated. I was so crushed, and I just sat back on my couch and laid there, just like crying. It's like those movies where you see someone just crying, eating chocolate or ice cream. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it looked like. It was like raining. It wasn't raining, but it was raining in my head. <laughs> so that's what it felt like. But I was okay. I'll call back. I'll check back in closer to Comic Con. So that year I didn't get in, I did call them around April, May, and they said, oh, you know, uh, no openings yet, but I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll bump you up to the top of the list. And I was like, okay, cool. And then the next day I actually called back like, hey, guess what? You're in. I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was like, yay. <laughs> and so when I got in, I actually got a better spot on a corner and I've been at that spot ever since. Um, and so for me, I always hope to get in. I don't ever think it's a sure thing. That's my mentality. And why I think that way is because San Diego is like the Mecca. That's basically sure. the yeah. con of all cons. So my thing is this year is going to be my last. That's my mentality. So that's why I go so hard. That's why you see me pumping out so much stuff because I'm thinking that, okay, if this is my last year, this is what I'm going to do. And that year that COVID happened, guess what? I was like, okay, well, if it's not happening again, I went out with a bang. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> it worked out in a bad way, but eh, it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's kind of my rationale and the way that mentally, that's what helps me prepare for this convention. So what do you contribute? What do you attribute to how popular you are at that convention? <sighs> I would say consistency being there a few years, word of mouth, a lot of people just spreading my artwork. 
and getting a lot of attention via social media and blogs. The yeah. San Diego Comic Con blog, they yeah. definitely hype me up. Um, and then just doing interviews, and again, just like I said, just people. I, I think when people see a line, they'll just line up. Yeah, <laughs> we, we all know this to be true. It's yeah. line of con, really. It's yeah. yeah, and that's the thing where I find hilarious is. I will be walking up the line, you know, helping people, you know, if they have any questions about my artwork. And then some people will be like, who's this line for? And I'd be like, <laughs> oh, it's for uh, this artist, Patrick Bowser. I was like, oh, okay. And they would just stay there. I'm like, no idea who I am. All right, that's cool. <laughs> Not like you should. I don't think you should, but I mean, that's cool if you just stop. And you're like, you're going to wait in this line to, yeah. to look at some artwork. Okay. okay. It's like people are just trained. So it's it's pretty funny. But yeah, I, I think it's now when it first erupted probably was when I started doing those 25 cent wonders. That was back in 2014 when I first started doing those. Uh -huh. And I think that kind of propelled it. And then now just being consistent, not only with that, but just trying to pump out different things each year. Okay. Because, yeah, there's always a line like, it's, yeah. It's, we, yeah, we I mean, there's... I think I saw, you also have like a lot of displays in front of you and like, Oh yeah, that's why I'm always outside. I stand out to the side, yeah, so that I can actually talk to people. That's that's why we like the corner. Uh, but again, I mean, that's, it's one of those things. Like I, I prepare if there's a line, but just like my wife says, if there's no line, I have to also prepare for that. Just like, just go with the flow right. type of thing. Well, so. I'm sure there will be a long line because of this podcast for sure. <laughs> See? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Putting it out there. <laughs> Putting it out there. It's gonna. The universe shall listen. Yeah. Uh, uh, wasn't sure how to word this particular question because I didn't want it to sound like loaded. <laughs> uh, as a professional artist, uh, do you think it's more important that you're creating art or making money or some combination of both? It's too loaded. I'm going to skip it. <laughs> fifth. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you have to be smart about it. And that's where a lot of artists aren't because we didn't get that business type of education or to think entrepreneurially. So there are a lot of artists out there that are successful and you look at their art, it's not that good, right? It's right. like decent, it's good, but it's not like epic. Right. And that's because those artists know how to market. They know how to put stuff out there. But yeah, when you listen to them talk or you listen to their interviews, you know it's just for the money. Right. Yeah. And yeah, we, we want to make money. You want, you want to make this a living, but there has to be a part of you where, you know, you're, you're doing it because you love doing it and you don't forget about that because like when COVID happened, I'm still creating artwork, you know, yeah, I'm going to, I want to make money, but I'm still creating artwork because it's, it's in my blood. It's my calling. It's not yeah. just a job. It's not a hobby. If I just want a job to make money, I could just be like one of these people that are just using AI to create an image and sell it on direct to printing or making all these stuff. And, and that's the thing now, right? People yeah. are just using AI to make an image and then sell it for a calendar, sell it on Etsy. That's their prerogative. That's how they want to make money. I want to do it the way I want to do it. Make art that's actually from me for people that I'm engaging with, that I've created this connection with. And then they're supporting me. It's like old school patrons. It's like Michelangelo, Da Vinci. I'm not near their caliber. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's that same old school. Like they did what they're able to do. They're able to create these masterpieces because they had people that supported and believed in them. And that's how I feel right now about, and I don't like to call people followers, but my supporters, you know, patrons, it's people yeah. that are, you know, allowing me the opportunity to create more artwork for them. So to, to go back to your question, you have to be able to make money. You have to be smart. You have to diversify what you're getting money from. You can't just put everything in, oh, I'm just going to be uh, going in animation, and that's it. If you see a lot of animation artists, a lot of them do kids' books. A lot of them do commercial work that they probably won't put on their site because it has nothing to do with what they do, but they get paid for it. Like there's all these storyboard jobs that I've done that I don't put on my site because, I mean, I can do them, but I don't want to do a lot of them, right? Yeah but I've proven that I can do them. So I get hired by these people who do storyboards. So I think that's the thing is you have to have a skill set that allows you to be malleable to the, the needs of your life, right? If yeah. you need to, if you need money, I'm not gonna judge you if you have to take 
you know, four of these low paying jobs because you have to make rent or because there was an emergency, you got to do what you got to do. But then as you get more and more established, you just have to be smart on what you're doing with those things. You have to understand that I do need to think about insurance. I do need to think about putting money away for my retirement. And those are things we don't talk about because we just talk about the art. We just talk about this. But as you get older and or even right now, as you are younger, you do want to start thinking about those things so that you're creating um, a parachute for yourself. And so for me, uh, I do have my master's, right? Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. I don't put it on my website, master's. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, what that allows me to do is later, if I ever wanted to, I can go to university, community college, whatnot. And I have that piece of paper that gate keeps people from uh, from stopping them from teaching there. I have that piece of paper that allows me to go to these institutions. As long as I meet that criteria, I'm a working professional, I can go in there and I could teach if I wanted to. And I'm fortunate that I do have a lot of colleagues that were in the master's program with me that, hey, if you want to teach, if you need one, let me know. And they know that I could teach. It's just that I don't want to go that route fully just yet. I'll yeah. still teach, but I don't want to go on the university level. If I can, if I need to. And so those are things that I think about. It's like, I can't put everything in here because there's going to be a point in time where I kind of just want to chill. Probably yeah. when I'm like 85, but I'm just saying, well, I want to chill. Yeah. yeah. Right now you have two different websites, the art yes. of Patrick and your, and your art shop. Yes. Why two? And uh, because the first website I have, patrickbalsaros.com, it was with a different web host, web provider, and they didn't have a shop at that time. Uh. So I created a different shop, Patrick Balsaros Art. And then I found out through a friend that, hey, your website's not working anymore. I'm like, what? Whoa. And so then I had to transfer it to Squarespace, and they have a shop. But since I already had the domain and I was using that um, via Shopify, the Patrick Balsaros Art, I was just like, oh, I'll just keep it. So yeah, that's why I have two. So one is just solely just for the shop, and the other one is where I actually put my portfolio and things like that. Okay. Because it looked like there was a place on the one that that kind of sent you to a shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just have the shop link up there, so it takes you to the to the other site. Okay. It's just it seemed a little easier. Got to clean. Yeah. Probably I'll clean up things later. I always say that, but <laughs> hopefully I will do it this time. <laughs> Uh, now that I was called out, thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's uh, just investigative so you know. reporting. You, t- you knew it would be a tough interview when you came on. Uh, <laughs> if you were to go back and relive your art career, is there anything you would have done differently? Uh, most people would say no. And I would probably have to say no also uh, because I don't think I would, I would be the same artist. I, it's it's those things where there's those, uh, I guess they would call it sliding door moments, mm-hmm. where if you made this decision, it could have gone one way yeah. or the other way. And they made a movie on that called Sliding Doors, yes. when the Paltrow, and I forgot the dude. <laughs> uh, so I think for me, if anything, um, the only thing that I would change is I thought I was going to be better at it, but I wanted to draw more and document more about my son growing up. Mm-hmm. I started really, really well, and then I fell off. So I think if anything, I would probably, I need, so I'll probably call myself out on this. I'll do more of it now. Uh, and I wish I had done more of it back then, just like documenting more. So I have a few sketches like up to like when he was one and I stopped doing it. Um, so it had nothing to do with my art career per se, but more in line of like, like my art heart, I would say. Right. Like what should I have done more with my art heart? Because with career and style and everything else, I think it's just going to develop how it develops. And I don't think I should question or do want to question those choices in the past because in some way or form, even if it didn't feel like it at the time, it kind of made me how I am right now. Uh, have you, without getting into too much detail, is uh, have you ever done a commission that you regretted? <laughs> None that I regret. Well, the only reason I'd say regret it is because it was large. So most of my commissions now, <clears throat> excuse me, are like eight and a half by 11 you know, mm-hmm. printer size. Yeah. But a few years ago before COVID, maybe two or three years ago, I started offering like a 12 by 18 size. Oh. 
And so this one person asked for, oh, can we have Thanos on like a jungle gym with all the Avengers coming up at him and then things coming out? Oh, no. I was like, oh, sure. <laughs> and then when I started drawing it, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is using up so much of my Copics. What's going on here? <laughs> and, I, and I didn't start it until maybe a week before Comic-Con, and I was like getting so drained. I was tired. That's when I think – I was still maybe taking commissions to the very last minute. And so I was like, the day before Comic-Con, I finished it. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. That's... <laughs> so it was more just because of just the size, not the, the, the subject matter. The subject matter was fun. It's just like, yeah, I'm going to scale it down. And now when I take commissions, it's basically like I started it in April, like just the beginning of this month. And I closed it after a week because it filled up. So I'm like, okay, I'm good. May, June, not touching anything else. Maybe. Uh, are there any dream projects you would want to work on? Oh, I think for me, I would. I'm trying to think which is the one thing the one work somehow, way, shape, or form with uh, Guillermo del Toro or Jorge Gutierrez. So, of course, Guillermo del Toro, uh, Guillermo del Toro, uh, Hellboy, yeah. Pan's Labyrinth, all that. Yeah. Um, and then Jorge Gutierrez, he's the one who did uh, Maya and the Three. And um, I think the other one he did was El Tigre. But I think one more other person, uh, actually, a set of directors that I'd want to work with. I've done um, artwork of everything ever all at once. Some way, shape, or form, I would love to work with the Daniels. Yeah. That, would be, <laughs> that would be the coolest thing ever because they're just geniuses and they do such fun work so yeah uh is there any advice you'd give to a prospective artist be curious definitely be curious ask questions um and learn how to ask questions i think that's important because people people will say there are no dumb questions there aren't any dumb questions but there's some annoying ones right <laughs> i don't know what they are but for each and so that that's what i would say is learning to ask questions and uh, kind of developing a timing for it and i think that's what that's what's great about a podcast is you kind of start to pick up on cues right you know how to carry a conversation how to end it how to keep going or how to like okay we'll we'll ease off there and, and I think that's what you want to take into whether you're in a classroom setting or a business setting is, is being able to kind of read people and be genuinely interested in what they're doing, what they have to offer, um, what they're up to. I, I think as an artist, a lot of times it is about us because, of course, you know, we're artists. We create stuff. It's that ego, right? Natural. Totally happens. But what I try to do is just ask about the other person. And I think that's the way I connect not only with other artists, other students, but also the people that buy art for them. I ask them, well, what do you like about it? Oh, what caught your eye? Or, you know, what do you do? You know, and I generally want to know. It's like, you're getting like my art, but it's, I want to see where you're coming from. Like, like I've heard some amazing things. Aerospace engineers, like, really? You get my art? That's cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. We work, work for SpaceX. We're doing this. I'm like, oh, you get my art? Okay. So it's just really cool when you find out the actual people that get your work and you're like, oh, wow, I never knew. And it just kind of opens up your world of what's really out there and the type of people that are out there. And I think that's really cool. Uh, I don't know if you've been asked this before, but do you have any hobbies outside of art? <laughs> so when I'm not drawing, I'm drawing. Uh, yeah, basically. I, I think for me, hobby-wise, I mean, Pilates is exercise slash hobby. There's at one point still thinking about it being a Pilates instructor in my downtime. Uh, my life, my life goal is to be a coach for m one of my nephew or my sons. If they ever go into my son, if he ever goes into sports, just so I can call fouls on people. I just want to do like <laughs> blocking, charging. I just want to do those hand movements. That's the only reason. <laughs> uh, but I would say hiking. Like I love, I like traveling. Traveling is a hobby there. I like going to different places, traveling to sketch. But see, there's a hit, there's a catch. I yeah. like traveling to sketch. Uh, I like hiking, especially when I get to catch up with my friends. And I think my biggest hobby is just hanging out with my friends. And it sounds silly, but you don't get to do that too often. So it's very enjoyable. So I find that's one of my most enjoyable hobbies is just being able to be around my friends and just be silly. 
Okay, we're, uh, we ask all of our guests this question and won't be offended if you haven't. Have you read any of Power Squared? No, I have not. I was uh, okay. <laughs> listening to some of the listening to some of the past podcasts though, just to get a feel of like what you guys talk about on here. Uh, yeah, and I caught one where it was the two two ladies impersonating you guys. Oh. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I think Rachel, I'm on the right Rachel. podcast. Rachel, okay, yeah. But yeah, they're they're the artists, right? They're, yes, they're, yes. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. those are hilarious. Uh, those are some of the best podcasts. Yes, yes. Yeah, they seem to have a really good time. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Rachel has uh, stopped being our artist, and Julia has, has moved from colorist to artist, and we're still kind of cool. Yeah, we're so, still transitioning. Yeah, and we're yeah we haven't get actually she's finishing up she just finished up her coloring, for, so we're we're gonna have to see what happens going forward. But it's a pretty exciting time for us. Yeah. So we hope that you will read it in the future. I mean, when we see you at Comic-Con, we're going to ask. If you've ever said oh, it. I know. That's yeah. why. I'm gonna, the night before, I'll be like, okay, let's look through really quick. Oh, yes, there we go. Okay, oh, yeah. that. okay cool. Like I know how to prepare. Okay, I got right. this. So if people want to follow you, what's the best way? Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, TikTok. So TikTok, I post like a lot of educational stuff and then some silly videos but mostly a lot a lot of educational stuff and tips uh twitter uh, i it's i communicate on there quite regularly a lot of times it's, it is morally more sdcc related and instagram that's the main one where i put in on each of those just look up patrick ballesteros and the icon should be my little space head kid it's like a green background and yeah. the space head kids like knocked out in white uh, so yeah that'll be me on all social media platforms all right all right, so uh, if you're watching this on YouTube later and you like this, uh, leave a like, subscribe if you want to see more, and leave a comment below if you have uh, any thoughts about our guest and his art. All right. Well, thank you again for being on the show. Appreciate you taking no problem. the time. And uh, we will definitely see you at Comic-Con, if, even if it's just in passing. Yes. <laughs> just like, yeah. The, the drive-by wave. There yeah, we go. Right. <laughs> so... Again, thank you very much for taking the time to be on the show. And we of course. Appreciate it. All right. So until next time, I'm David Hankins. I'm Paul Hankins. I'm Trevor Hankins. And you've been on the air with Power Squared.